Welcome back, class, to our literature section and going back into Johnny Tremaine. I hope you've enjoyed the introduction in chapters one and two. Remember to read those if you haven't. Go back and do that. And then remember to also have com hope you've completed your chapter study questions before jumping into this reading. We'll be reading chapters three and four, and this will get us caught up so that we're back on track. And then we've had to read a few more chapters this week to get us on pace. But after we get to chapter four, we are on track and we'll only have to read two chapters a week so let's dive into chapter three an earth of brass i guess to uh, but sorry before we jump in let's recall we recalled how johnny tremaine read, uh, started to work on the on sunday to try to finish mr hancock's sugar basin um he uh was given a bad um a tool that had a crack in it and so he ended up burning his hand and now uh, he is just kind of doing chores and not really working anymore and Mr. Lap Mr. Lapham talked to Johnny about finding another trade that he could go into uh, that he could be successful even with having a um, lame hand a hand that doesn't work properly so that's where we left off so now let's get into chapter three Weeks wore on. September was ending. A large part of every day, Johnny spent doing what he called looking for work. He did not really want to follow any trade but his own. He looked down on soap boilers, leather dressers, rope makers, and such. He did not begin his hunt along Hancock's Wharf and Fish Street, where he and his story were well known and the masters would have been apt to employ him from pity. He went to the far ends of Boston. Mr. Lapham had told him to stand about and watch different artisans as their trades until... He was sure it was work he could do. Then he was to address the master politely, explain about his bad hand, and ask to be taken on. But Johnny was too impatient, too unthinking, and too scornful. He barged into shop after shop, along with the great wharves and up and down Cornhill and Orange Ann and Ship Streets, Dock Square, King and Queen Streets. Did the master want another boy, keeping his hand hidden in his pocket? His quickness and address struck everyone favorably, and so an old clockmaker eagerly agreed to take him on, especially when he told him that he had already served Mr. Lapham two years. But why, my boy, is Mr. Lapham ready to part with you? Now that you must be of value to him, I have a bad hand. Let me see it. He did not want to show his hand, but the master always insisted. He would take it out of the pocket where he always kept it with a flourish, display it to the sickening curiosity of the master. Apprentices, journeyman, lady customers. After such an experience, he would sometimes loiter and swim for the rest of the day. Sometimes he would grit his teeth and plunge headlong into the next shop. He rarely bothered to look at the signs over the door, which indicated what work was done inside. A pair of scissors for a tailor, a gold lamb for a wool weaver, a basin for a barber, a painted wooded book for a book binder, a large swinging compass for an instrument maker. Although more and more people were learning how to read, the artisans still had signs above their shops, not wishing to lose a possible patron merely because he happened to be illiterate. Having been told by one clockmaker he would not suit, Johnny walked in on two more and got the same answer. A butcher, his sign was a gilded ox skull, would have employed him, but the idea of slaughtering animals sickened him. He was a fine craftsman to the tips of his fingers, even to the tips of his maimed hand. Now he never came home from the hearty midday dinner. Mrs. Lapham, Madge, and Dorcas were always pointing out how much he ate and how little he did. He knew Mrs. Lapham was looking around for a grown-up silversmith who would come in as a partner for Grandpa. And She said, looking straight at Johnny, she would not ask him to sleep in the attic with the boys. With the two boys, he was to have the birth and death room. I declare, she said one day, no business can be run with just a feeble old man and three of the most worthless boys in Boston eating their heads off. Seems she was ne negotiating with Mr. Tweedy, newly arrived from Baltimore. He had arrived alone, but she must make sure he was really was a bachelor or a widow, <clears throat> a widower. Obviously, whatever partner she found for her father-in-law must marry one of her poor fatherless girls. The shop must stay in the family. So Johnny ate as little as he could and did not come home at noon. But someone would usually slip a piece of hard bread, cheese, jerk beef, or s salt fish, and Johnny cake. In the pocket of his jacket as he hung it on its hook he knew it was Scylla but he never spoke to her about it his unhappiness was so great he felt himself completely cut off from the rest of the world but sometimes as he lay in the sun 
on Beacon Hill or Copse Hill among the graves or cold himself upon a coil of rope along a wharf eating the food she had managed to get for him. He would dream of the great things he would do for her. When he was man grown, there were three things she longed for a gold necklace, a gray pony with a basket cart, and a little sa- so, sorry, a little sailboat. He dreamed of himself as successful rich. Never as the ditch digger sorry, never as the ditch digger and rat rag picker, Mrs. Latham was always suggesting to him. Some days there was no food in his pocket. Then he went hungry. One such day he was strolling up Salt Lane. Here about him and on Union Street were printing offices. It was noon, and all over Boston work hard work had stopped and everyone except himself had either gone home for dinner or two of the famous taverns. Sorry, or two of one of the famous taverns. Above one tiny shop he saw a sign that attracted him. It was a little man in bright blue coat and red breeches. Solemnly, solemnly, solemnly gazing at Salt Lane through a spyglass. So this was where the Boston Observer was published. The Latfums took no newspaper, but he heard Mr. Latham speak of the wicked observer and how it was trying to stir up discontent in Boston, urging the people to revolt against the mild rule of England. The comical little painted man looked so genial, so ready to welcome anyone. And Johnny stepped in. He might have guessed he would waste his time. Of course, the master would be off for dinner. But because he had liked the painted sign, he went in. He had not even stopped to consider whether or not a printer's work was something that he could do. He saw the squat, bug-like printing press, the trays of type, the strings on which printed sheets were hung to dry like clothes on a line. On a workbench was a smaller press for notifications, proclamations, broadsides, trade cards. Everything smelled of printer's ink. A boy larger than himself and probably a few years older was standing at a counter talking with a stout market woman in a frayed red skirt. Her pig had strayed from her yard. She wished to advertise it. The boy wrote down what she said. Lost. A spotted so from White Bread Alley, the boy repeated. She was the dearest pig, said the woman. Would come for a whistle like a dog. My children taught her to play. Dead pig. We don't ever think to eat her. Only her increase. We called her Mira. The boy did not write that down. He lifted his dark face, indolent dark eyes. The lashes flickered. He was interested. Was she hard to teach, ma'am? Oh, no. Pigs are clever. I never knew that. How did they compare with dogs? Then the old lady began to talk. She talked about pigs in general and her Myra in particular. The printer's boy, unruffled, unhurried, heard her through. He was tall and powerful, powerfully built. There was something a little sluggish in his casual movements and his voice, almost as though... He was saving himself for emergencies, not wasting himself on every casual encounter. The woman was delighted with so good a listener and his few intelligent questions. Johnny, standing at the door, forgot his own errand. He had no idea that either pigs or old market women could be so interesting. It was the apprentice, standing at the counter in his leather apron and full white shirt, his thoughtful face framed in hair, black and straight as Indians, who had cast a spell over the old gossip and her subject. Although the boy had nodded casually as Johnny came in, he did not speak to him until after the woman was gone and he had set up the few lines of type. There was nothing rude about this seeming neglect. It was almost as if they were friends of long standing. The strange boy had none of the bustling smartness of the usual Boston apprentice. Johnny had seen enough of them in the last month. Apprentices who knew what you wanted and that you would not suit, and you were out on the street again in three minutes. Having set the advertisement, the boy took a covered basket from under the counter, put it on a table, and drew up two stools. Why don't you sit, he said, and eat. My master's wife, she's my aunt, always sends over more than I can manage. Seemingly, he had sized up everything with only half a glance from the lazy dark eyes. He had known Johnny was hungry without once really looking at him, and had also known that he was someone he himself liked. He was both friendly and aloof. Nonchalantly, he took off his Claps knife, cut hunks of bread from the long loaf. There were also cheese, apples, and ham. The ham seemed to remind the printer's boy of the gossip and her pig. I grew up on a farm, he said, but I never knew you could teach a pig tricks. Help yourself to more bread. Johnny hesitated. So far, he had not taken his bad hand out of his pocket since entering the shop. Now he must or go hungry. He took the clasp knife in his left hand and stealthily drew from the maimed hand to steady the loaf. It was hard to saw through the crusty loaf with the left hand, but he managed to do it. It took him a long time. The other boy said nothing. He did not, thank God, offer to help him. 
Of course, he had seen the crippled hand, but at least he did not stare at it. Asked no questions. Seemingly, he saw everything and said nothing. Because of this quality in him, Johnny said, I'm looking for some sort of work I think I could do well in, even with a bad hand. That's quite a recent burn. It was the first intelligent remark any man, woman, or child had made about Johnny's hand in any shop he had been in. I did it last July. I am... I was apprenticed to a silversmith. I burned it on hot silver. I see. So everything you are trained for is out. Yes, I wouldn't mind so much being a clockmaker or instrument maker, but I can't and I won't be a butcher nor a soap boiler. No, I've got to do something I like. Or, or the dark boy put the question to him he had not been able to ask himself. Or what? Johnny lifted his thin face, bare face. His lips parted before he spoke. I just don't know. I can't think. Apparently, the printer's boy did not know either. All he said was, more cheese? Then Johnny began to talk. He told all about the Laflams and how he somehow couldn't seem even to thank Scylla for the food she usually got to him. How cross and irritable he had become, how rude to people who told him they were sorry for him. And he admitted he had used no sense in looking for a new job. He told about the burn, but none of the belligerent arrogance which with which he had been answering the questions kind people had put to him. As he talked to Rab, for the boy had told him this was his name, for the first time since the accident he felt able to stand aside from his problems, see himself. Mr. Thorne, Rab's uncle by marriage, came back. He was a scholarly young man with a face as sharp and bright as a fox. Rab did not immediately spring into action and make a good show of his industry before his master. He had none of the usual, yes sir, no sir, please sir. He went on calmly eating bread and cheese. On Mr. Thorne's heels came two little boys in big aprons, the Webb twins. Seemingly, they went back to their master's house across Salt Lane for dinner, while the nephew ate out of a basket and minded the shop. The Webbs were set to work. Mr. Thorne began to ink a pad. Johnny felt he must go. Rab walked him, walked with him to the door. He was still eating bread and cheese. I don't know how you'll make out, said Rab. Of course, you can get work if you'll take it. I know, unskilled work. Yes, work you don't want. But the dinner had raised John's hopes. I feel sure I'll get something. Overhead, the little man with the spy glass and the red breeches was swinging in the wind, observing Boston from a variety of angles. Rab said, There's some work here you could do, not the sort that teaches a boy a skilled trade, just writing for us, delivering papers all over Boston and around. Nothing you'd want, but if you can't find anything else, you come back. I'll come back, all right, but not until I can tell you what a good job I found myself. You have any folks? None at all. I've got lots of relatives, said Rab, but my parents are dead. <clears throat> oh, come again? I'll come. It wasn't the food alone that so raised Johnny's hopes. It was Rab himself. An ease and confidence flowed out and supported those around him. The market woman had felt better about losing her Mira after she had talked with Rab. He was the first person to whom Johnny Tremaine had confided his own story. The coming of Mr. Percival Tweedy Journeyman Silversmith of Baltimore cast a longer and longer shadow over the Lapham household and conversation. While the terms of partnership were being drawn up, he stayed at a cheap lodging house on Fish Street. Johnny left right after breakfast and often did not return until dark. He did not meet Mr. Tweedy for a long time, and he got tired of hearing about him. Mr. Tweedy was ready to sign the contract of partnership Mrs. Lapham had, had, had drawn up, and Mr. Tweedy would not sign. When Mr. Tweedy came to the shop, it was Dorcas he seemed to fancy. No, it was Madge. Although almost 40, he was still a bachelor. Mrs. Lapham had asked him about that. Johnny, had, Johnny already hated the very sound of his name, and then one morning, before breakfast, he met him. Mr. Tweedy was diffidently standing about in the shop, hoping Mrs. Lapham would ask him to breakfast. He was fingering a pocketbook sent in for a new clasp, and his stomach was rolling from hunger. Hey, said Johnny rudely. The timid creature jumped like a shot rabbit and dropped the pocketbook. What are you doing here? The boy demanded, pretending he, caught, he had caught a thief. Mr. Tweedy swallowed twice, his Adam's apple rising and falling with motion, but said nothing. Are you a thief, or are you that Tweedy man I've heard tell of? I'm Tweedy. I'm Johnny Tremaine. You don't say. I'll tell Mrs. Latham you're here for breakfast. I just happened by, I just thought I'd come in. He had a queer, squeaky voice. Johnny disliked him even more than he had, he had expected. Such impotence, such timidity, and a grown man irritated the boy. Oh, come out with it, Flat, he said. You've been getting your dinners here for free for two weeks, and now you're filling out for breakfast? I don't care, not me, but I'll warn the woman to put on an extra plate. The man said nothing, but he looked at Johnny, and the look of bleak hatred amazed the boy. 
He had not guessed Mr. Tweedy had that much gumption in him. Mrs. Latham came thumping down the stairs. It was her second trip to the foot of the attic ladder, and she still wasn't sure Dove and Dusty were out of bed. Everything had gone wrong. Breakfast was late. Madge had a felon on her finger and wasn't good for anything. And Dorcas was complaining because there was no butter for breakfast. She had slapped Dorcas, who had gone out back to cry. How easily, smoothly everything had gone in the old days before Johnny got hurt. Then the household went like clockwork. Then the household went like clockwork, and the shop had earned money for butter and butcher's meat once or twice a week. The sight of Johnny Tremaine standing there in the lower hall, lower hall doing nothing, good for nothing, irritated her. Hurry, she snorted and waddled into the kitchen. Johnny on her heels. The fire was smoking, and she sh knelt down to mend it. Johnny might have done that while she, she was upstairs. Although Johnny was now looked upon as something as a black sheep, Mrs. Latham was no longer telling him he would end up picking rags but on the gallows. He thought it behooved him to tell her just what he thought of Mr. Tweedy. I can see why that Tweedy has never been a master smith. He hasn't the force of character. As a man, he's no good. If he is a man, which I doubt, I think he is somebody spinster aunt dressed up in men's clothes. Mrs. Latham heaved herself to her knees and brushed back her streaming hair with a red forearm. You don't say. Her voice showed her ex um, exasperation. She had found Mr. Tweedy herself. She was turning to nurse him along to get the, wear the wary creature to sign her contract and marry one of her girls. Yep, I do say, said Johnny. I've just been talking with him. He's no good and he's here now. Yep, in the shop. The squeak pig is trying to horn in on breakfast. The doors were all open. Anyone in the shop could have heard Johnny's insults. Slowly, like a great sow, uh, pulling out of a wallow, Miss Slapham got to her feet, glaring down at Johnny, her enormous bosom heaving. Now I'm going to tell you what I think of that squeak pig. Without a word, and before he could finish his remarks or dodge, Miss Latham gave him a resounding cuff on the ear. Sometimes actions do speak louder than words, she said, and this is one of them times. You get right out here, Johnny Tremaine. That tongue of yours isn't going to do any more damage in my house. Johnny grabbed his jacket. Scylla had not yet put food in it pulled his tattered hat over his eyes and stalked out. Since his accident, he had unconsciously taken to wearing his hat at a rakish angle. This, and the way he always kept his right hand thrust into his breeches pocket, gave him a slightly arrogant air. The arrogance had always been there, but formerly it had come out in pride in his work, not in the way he wore his hat and walked. He told no one what he did all day, and Mrs. Latham was convinced that he had taken to, or was about to take, to evil ways. He did look, at times, both shabby and desperate, in other words, a potential criminal. Sometimes he looked so proud and fine people thought he must be a great gentleman's son in misfortune. One thing he did not look like any more was a smart, industrious Boston apprentice. He walked down Fifth Street to Anne, crossed Dock Square with fin uh, Finnell Hall on his left. It was market day. He picked his way about the farm carts, the piles of whitish green cabbages, baskets of yellow corn, rows of plump, pale, plucked turkeys, orange pumpkins, country cheeses, big as baby's heads. Big as a baby's head. Some of the market folk, men and women, children and black slaves, called to him, seeing in the shabby, proud boy a possible rich customer. But others counted the pats, the pats of butter on their tables after he had passed by. Without heeding anyone, he crossed Dock Square and in a moment's time stood beside the brick townhouse at the head of King Street. The lower floor of the townhouse was an open promenade and here every day the merchants gathered on change not a merchant in sight they did not raise as early as market folk suddenly john had an idea although seemingly he had tried every shop in boston in search of a new master he had not tried the merchants from where he sat on the steps of the townhouse he could look the brief length on of king street which quickly and imperceptibly um, turned into long wharf uh, running for half a mile into the, into the sea. It was the only wharf in Boston larger than Hancock's. There was not another wharf in all America so large, so famous, so rich. As at his own wharf, one side was built up solidly, solidly with counting houses, warehouses, sail lofts, stores. The other side was left open for the ships. Already sailors, porters, riggers, and such were at work. He waited, it seemed to him, for a long time, and then the clerks began to arrive. Counting house doors were unlocked. Warehouses were unchained. At last the merchants came, some striding down King Street, rosy-faced, double-chinned, known and greeted by everyone, apparently knowing and greeting everyone in return. Some came in chases, gigs, 
Some had sour, glimmet eyed faces. Some had not yet lost the rolling gait of sea captains. Johnny saw the same gray horse and gig with the arms open the door that had carried John Hancock to Latham's last July. Trot quickly down King Street onto Long Wharf. Although Mr. Hancock had recently bought Hancock's Wharf, his principal place of business was on Long. Mr. Hancock has a as on a cherry road red coat, Johnny thought. He drives a horse himself, but now he is getting out, telling that dressed up doll of a black boy to put his horse up for him. Johnny decided he would start at the top of the merchants and work down, only of course skipping merchant light. He'd go first to John Hancock from where he sat. He could see that a great ship was slowly warping in. No coaster this, no mere sugar boat from the sugar isles. A number of flat, uh, fashionable dressed young men as well as the usual dock hands and porters were crowding about to welcome her. There was the heavy clatter of a great coach almost beside him, and a coachman was bawling to lesser folk. Make way, make way, black horses and glittering, silver mounted harnesses, the rumble and rattle of a ruby coach on cobbles, and on the door uh, panel the family crest, a rising eye, half seen inside, merchant Jonathan Light, evidently he had just heard his ship was in and had come down from his mansion on Beacon Hill in a hurry. He was still struggling with the lace about his throat. Johnny left his seat and strolled down the wharf to watch. No one ever told him not to watch the lights, but he always felt guilty when he did. From afar off, he knew them all. He knew, for instance, that Mr. Light had a broken front tooth. He knew Mrs. Light was dead and two sons had been drowned as boys, and girls had died in infancy. This he could read upon the slate gravestones of Copse Hill. He knew that besides the town house on Beacon Hill, there was a country seat at Milton and he knew that Lafayette Light had spent the last summer in London. Now she was back in Boston once more. She was very tall for a woman, slender and graceful, and moved slowly down the gangplank with the stately self-conscious, which, uh, which happened to be the fashionable gait for a lady at the moment. A hundred times before, Johnny had stopped on the streets of Boston or before a house to watch her. He but one more gaping face in a crowd. She, the accepted reigning belle, he admired her odd, strong beauty, which, unlike her regal gait, was not of the fashionable type. To begin with, she was too tall, and golden curls, pink and white skin, were the mode. She was a black-haired woman, and only for balls and such was her was she powdered and curled. In contrast, her skin was dead white. Her features were clear-cut enough to justify the poems written to her in London, and even here in Boston, comparing her to a classic goddess. There was only one flaw to her marble beauty. Between the low sweeping black brows was a tiny um, perpendicular line. Once and only once the master had car hat hand, the master hand that carved her face had let the chisel slip. This blemish was odd enough for a young lady still in her twenties. It boded no good for her for the peace of mind of those about her, nor for her own. Now she was all glitter and smiles, greeting the young gentlemen who had come to meet her. Johnny did not notice what she wore, uh, but the Mantua makers, dressmakers, milliners, glovers, and ju jewelers all knew that whatever Lafinia Light brought back from London would set Boston styles for the winter. Oh, papa, papa, she suddenly exclaimed. There was an urgency in her voice, a soft flash in her eyes none of the young men's faces had called forth. Like any country girl, merely glad to be home again, she flung herself into her father's arm. Spiritually, Johnny shrugged, determined to be neither over-impressed nor envious, that overdressed moppet, that lean beanpole, for Miss Lafinia was lean in comparison to Madge and Dorcas, who had always been held up to Johnny as the end-all of feminine beauty. beauty. Bad temper, too. I hope she kills herself eating, overeating cakes and plum pudding, turkeys with stuffing and gravy, and hot white rolls. His stomach was gnawing at him. He forgot Lafinia light as he thought of the wonderful things it was her privilege to overeat if she wished. Surely by now enough time had passed since John Hancock's arrival at his counting house so that he would be ready to talk to a likely boy looking for his work. His hand might be good enough for a cabin boy. Johnny found one does not step into a great merchant's counting house and see the merchant as easy, easily as one steps into a shop and sees the master artisan. Although he had made up his mind that he would begin his conversation with Mr. Hancock, by explaining he had burned a hand, he did not see any reason why he should explain to the clerk who stopped him in the outer office. All he said was that he wanted work. The clerk asked him if he could read and write. He said he could. The thin, weak-eyed gentleman gave him a 
mor mortgage and told him to read that. This he read well. Then Mr. Hancock, who had been sitting alone over his little hearth fire in the back office, came out. He had been attracted by the quality of the boy's voice, for although Johnny often spoke in the rougher, slurring manner of Hancock's wharf, in reading he reverted to the cleaner speech his mother had taught him. Mr. Hancock did not recognize him as the apprentice of Mr. Lapham, who had rashly, rashly promised a sugar basin in time for his Aunt Lydia's birthday, and then the old man had been forced at last to admit he could not do it. Add this, my lad, he said, handing Johnny an invoice he held in his hand. Johnny added easily. He was given a few more simple sums, which he did in his head. The clerk and merchant exchanged glances. Mr. Hancock said, If your handwriting is as good as your reading and ciphering, I promise you a place right here in my counting house. I've been put to it to find just the right boy, your writing. I've been taught to write, but Johnny was suddenly frightened. The clerk put a piece of paper before him and, and, and inked and inked a pen. Write John Hancock, Esquire. Johnny stubbornly start, stared at the paper. At least he had found a place where he wanted to be, and he knew that ever and again boys who started working for great merchants became great merchants themselves. Surely, surely, if he only tried hard enough, he could do it. He could write for the length of just Jan John Hancock, Esquire. His hand shot out of his pocket, grasped the pen. The letters were as clumsy as though written with the left hand. The clerk laughed. Mr. Hancock had never seen worse writing. The merchant said, My boy, you must have been rat rattled. Surely you can do better than that. Johnny stared at his miserable scratches. God help me, he whispered. It is the best I can do. Why, the lad has a crippled hand. Look, Mr. Hancock. Mr. Hancock quickly averted his fine eyes. Run away, boy, run away. You knew you could not do the work, and yet you came and took up my valuable time, and... But I thought maybe you could ship me as a cabin boy. And carry the captain's grog? And be brisk and useful to him? No, no, my captains want whole boys. So now go away, please. Johnny wandered off. I burned my hand making you a silver basin. Now it is go away, please. He flung himself down in the shadow of a sail loft, for the late September day was warm as summer. He could hear the tap of shipwrights, hammers, the creak of wooden wheels, a boat swaying whistle. Everywhere boys and men were at work, only he was idle. He saw picking his way delicately around barrels of molasses, bales, ox teams, a familiar, fantastic figure. It was Mr. Hancock's little black slave, Jehu, he was looking for from si looking from side to side. When he saw Johnny, he went to him and said like a parrot, My master, Mr. Jancock, Esquire, has commanded me to give this purse to the poor working work boy and the broken shoes who just left his counting house, and to tell him that he wishes him well. Johnny took the purse. It was heavy. That much copper would provide him with food for days. He opened it. It was not copper, but silver. John Hancock had not been able to look at the crippled hand, nor could he help but make this handsome present. The thought of laughing in a light, gorging herself to death, if it pleased her, on fine foods had started the gastric juices in his stomach an hour ago. He had no breakfast, and for supper the night before only one salt alewife and a mug of milk. It was noontime, and he craved food. Not the mere coarse bread, cheese, ale, apples, which had always made up the large part of his diet, but rare, interesting things such as he had smelled cooking in rich people's houses in the best taverns, but had never tasted. First he tormented his hunger by going from one tavern kitchen to the next to see which smelled the best. At the bunch of grapes I made was basting a roast of beef. A spicy pudding was bubbling on the hearth. At the king's coffee house, a suckling pig was so crisp and brown it was fairly bursting. He almost drooled at the, this pig, but walked on, and everywhere he smelled chocolate and coffee. He had never in his life tasted either. He stopped in the kitchen of the Afric Queen when he saw there made him feel he had swallowed a small live kitten, but he could almost enjoy these pangs, for in his pocket was Mr. Hancock's silver. Any minute could uh, a sausage assage that kitten, and so to the Cromwell head and back again to Union Street. His mind was made up. He would dine at the Afric Queen. For there he had seen maids roasting innumerable small squabs, each stuffed with fragrant dressing and wrapped in bacon. And he had seen pastries, apple, mince, pumpkin, pumpkin, plum tarts coming out of the brick oven. The crust in them was an inch thick and so short and flaky it looked like scorched tissue paper. Well, kitten, he said, contentedly, contentedly, to his stomach as he took his seat humbly in the kitchen where grooms and such were fed while their betters ate in the dining rooms. You're going to have more than a saucer of milk today. You'd like 
How'd you like, say, five of those little squabs? But then he began to give his order to the serving maid. She giggled and ran off for the landlady. Now, boy, this lady said to him firmly, you just show me the color of your money. Satisfied, she grunted and told the maid to serve the little master. This young girl was hardly older than Scylla. She could not help laughing at the things he ordered. The five little squabs, three of each kind of pastry, a wreath of jellied eels, because she said it was a specialty of the house, a tipsy parson, white bread tied into little knots, buttered and baked, and a pot of coffee and another of chocolate. When Johnny saw a dish being prepared in the kitchen for some dinner in the other room, he would call for some of that, and she giggled again and fetched it for him. There was only one disappointment. The smell of coffee had always attracted him. He was disappointed at the bitter taste. The chocolate, however, was even better than he had dared to hope. But when he had came to pay, he was um, chagrined to find so much of his money had gone to fill and overfill his stomach. The kitten was no longer gnawing inside him. Trying to get out, in fact, it was no longer a kitten. I feel as if I had swallowed a Newfoundland, Newfoundland dog and it had died in me. What a fool he had been. He thought suddenly of Rab, that Rab wouldn't have let himself go, go so. And for the first time, standing in the cobbled stable yard behind the inn, he realized that the back of that little building he saw beyond the Afric Queen stables was the printing shop of the Boston Observer on Salt Lane. He wanted to cross through the back yards, go, go to see that rab, but thought better of it. Not until he came as a friend and equal, not as a beggar, no. He decided he would buy himself some shoes. His own flapped as he walked. His toes showed, but he hadn't liked it liked it when Jehu had referred to him as a boy with broken shoes. As he left the cobblers, his new shoes squeaked on his feet. He saw a peddler pushing a barrow of limes up Cornhill. Fine limes and fine lemons and limes, lemons and limes. There was nothing in the world a Santa so craved as limes, and Mrs. Latham could not buy them for her. They were too dear. But sometimes sailors from the Indies or storekeepers would give her one because she was so beautiful and would hug and kiss anyone who gave her a lime. Johnny filled the pockets of his jacket and breeches with limes. Now for Scylla, he could not buy her a gray a pony, a gold necklace, nor a little sailboat. He went into a stationer's. There he found a book with the most wonderful pictures of Calvinistic martyrs dying horrible but pray prayerful deaths. He glanced at the text. With his help, she would soon be able to read it. Next, he bought pastel crayons, but he passionately regretted all those squabs. He had no money left to get her drawing paper. His new shoes fitted to a nicety. If the Newfoundland dog was a heavier tenant in his stomach than the kitten, it was more restful. His pockets were full of fine gifts. He whistled as he walked and entered the lap from kitchen ready to tell of his adventure with Mr. Hancock. The women folk, the women folk had spent all day paring apples, threading them on strings, preparing them to dry them for the winter. Even Mrs. Lapham looked tired. The lazy apprentice bursting in, happy for the first time in two months, irritated her. Then she saw his new shoes. Johnny Tremaine, she cried. What have you been up to? What? You wicked, wicked boy. Oh, I declare you are going to bring disgrace on us all. He did not understand. Them shoes, she roared. You've never got them, honestly. You've taken to thieving. I'm going to tell your master. He'll call a corn, call a constable, and then see if you, constable, and then see if you darest not tell where you stole them. You've just gone from worse to worse. You're going to get whipped for this, set in the stocks. You're going to jail. You'll end up on the gallows. He let her scold, shake her rattles at him, and as she flounced out of the room, Madge and Dorcas saw their chance to escape for a moment. All afternoon, Frizzle Jr., the leather dresser, had been standing outside on the street waiting for one of the others to come out. Frizzle Jr. was not was an accepted suitor, but no one knew whether it was Madge or Dorcas he was after. Mrs. Latham didn't know. The girls didn't know. Frizzle Jr. himself did not seem to know. Both Madge and Dorcas were now wild to get out, and after him it looked as though whichever one was not Mrs. Frizzle would end up Mrs. Tweedy. Johnny stood before Scylla and Asana, who had huddled together in a corner of the settle like frightened little animals as her mother accused Johnny of theft. He smiled, and they smiled. He was so happy about his gifts that he forgot his misfortunes. Scylla said happily, I know you didn't steal. Of course not. Look, girl, I've got crowns for you. He put them on the table. For me? And a book with pictures. Now, Sill, the printing is so easy, I think you can almost teach yourself to read. Oh, Johnny, look, look at that funny little man. See, he's got tiny little buttons on his coat. Oh, I never thought to own a book with pictures. 
He began fishing limes out of his frayed pockets. The Santa jumped about him like a puppy. Limes, limes, she cried. They began to fall on the floor, rolling in all directions. All three children went down after them. Scylla was almost happier over her Santa's pleasure than her own. Johnny was happiest of all. For the first time, he completely forgot his crippled hand. It was as... It was all as if nothing had happened, and he and Scylla and his Santa were all one again. He was pretending not to give the limes to the little girl. He was going to put them back in his pockets, but she knew they were for her. She wrapped her herself about him, hugging him, kissing the front of his shirt. This was as far as she could reach. He started to pick her up in his arms, hold her over his head, until she said, Please, pretty. Suddenly, Santa's delighted cries changed to hysterical screams. Don't touch me. Don't touch me with that dreadful hand. Johnny stopped. It was the worst thing anyone had said to him. He stood like stone, his hand thrust back into his pocket. Scylla froze too, half under the kitchen table, a lime in her hand. Oh, his Santa, how could you? The nervous child went on screaming. Go away, Johnny, go away. I hate your hand. Scylla slapped her and she burst into tears. So he went away. Now he was sure that what they all felt as Santa had been young enough to say. He felt in his heart was broken. He felt his heart was broken. Once again, he started to walk until he was so tired that he could not think. The long, late September night had already begun before he reached the town gates on the neck. Beyond him in the sim semi-darkness running across mud flats was the one road which connected Boston with the mainland. And here the gallows on which Mrs. Latham promised him to end. He turned back from the lonely pace, place. The gallows and the graves of the suicides frightened him a little. He wandered about through the salt marshes at the foot of the common uh, circling until he came out on Beacon Hill. There he sat in orchard for quite a while. It was either Mr. Lights or Mr. Hancock's, for the houses stood aside, stood side by side. He saw the glitter of candles throughout the great mansions. Guests coming and going, heard the music of a spinet. Um, his Santa's word, words rang in her ears. He who had struggled hard, never to cry, now wished that he could. Then he walked off into sparsely settled West Boston. Behind the pest house, by lantern light, men were digging a hurried grave. He left West Boston and, skirting Dirty Mill Cove, came at last into his own North Boston. On Hole Street, he heard the staves of the town watch and the feet of the watchmen clumping on cobbles. But by, no, by law, no apprentice was allowed out so late. He slipped into Cobbs Hill graveyard to hide until they were gone. One o'clock and warm fair night, and a warm fair night called the watch. It was indeed warm and fair, and no hardship to spend such a night out under the moon and stars. Around him, around about him, everywhere lay the dead uh, um, worthies of Boston. Uh, their slate stones stood shoulder to shoulder. This was the highest land in Boston, next only to Beacon Hill. Here, close to Hole Street, his mother was buried in an unmarked grave. He had forgotten where and flung himself down beside the spot. Then he began to cry. He had not been able to cry before. It was as if Santa's words had broken down the last strength in him. He cried half for himself and half because he knew how sorry his mother would be for him if she knew. I can't do decent work. I can't ever be a silversmith, not even a watchmaker. My friends don't want to touch me. My friends don't want me to touch them with my dreadful hand. Seemingly neither the moon nor the stars above him nor the dead about him cared. Then he lay face down, sobbing and saying over and over that God had turned away from him, but his frenzied weeping and giving him some release. He must have slept. He sat up suddenly wide awake. The moon had seemingly come close and, come close and closer to him. He could see the coats of arms, the winged death hands on the slate stones about him. He was so wide awake he felt someone must have called his name. His ears were straining to hear the next words. What was it his mother had said so long ago? If there was nothing left and God himself had turned away his face, then and only then Johnny was to go to Mr. Light. In his ears rang his mother's sweet remembered accents. Surely for one second, between sleeping and waking, he had seen her dear face, loving, gentle, intelligent, floating toward him through the moonlight on Copse Hill. He sat a long time with his arms hugging his knees. Now he knew what to do. This very day he would go to Merchant Light. When at last he lay down, he slept heavily, without a dream and without a worry. That looks like a picture of Mr. Hancock asking Johnny to um, Johnny to read or write. Okay, that's chapter three. I will see you guys in chapter four.